Hey, Ingingy fans, I'm Isabella, a.k.a. Izzy B., the team manager for Ingingy, and I'm here with Mike McKnight, otherwise known as the Low Carb Runner. I'm sure many of you follow Mike on Instagram, um, but if you don't, let me just tell you a quick few quick things about him. Mike is an elite ultra runner who lives the low-carb, not no-carb diet, a 200-mile champ who won the Triple Crown of 200s in 2019, is a running coach, a husband, a father, most recently got second place at the Cocodono 250, and is currently training for the Badwater 135. So Mike, welcome. Thanks for chatting with us today. How you doing, man? I am good. Just trying to take care of some upset children and also doing this. <laughs> Disclaimer here, there might be dogs barking or, or children screaming in the background, but you know, that's all good. <laughs> All right, so just going to run through some questions here so our followers can know what you've been up to. Um, so recently, you just got second place at the Cocodona 250, where you actually had some stomach issues, but you were able to problem solve and work your way through that and had an amazing comeback. Uh, for those of you that watched the Cocodona 250 live, we were like on the you know, seat of our pants there watching and listening, like what's going on with Mike McKnight? Like you're go to bed at 10 PM and you wake up at 5 AM and you're like, what? He's in the top five, just picking off the runners. And you ended up finishing in second place. So why don't you just tell us a little bit of that experience and how that happened? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, um, I just made a rookie mistake and that's why I had stomach issues from the get-go. Um, I tried something new that morning and just like in retrospect, I don't know what I was thinking, not trying something new, but like the philosophy of what I tried, like it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> um, basically, I did this race last year and I had a terrible experience. I had to go to the hospital for um, heat related stuff. And so before this race, I was like, I'm just going to really um, load up on electrolytes. So that way I can just be ahead before like I even start digging that hole and getting behind. And I just took, I, I, I took about 4,000 milligrams of sodium before I started, um, which is way too much for, in the time frame that I took that amount of sodium. And so, um, like the first 50 miles, like I was having some, like, like I was just in that stage where I was like, my stomach could turn like any minute. Um, I don't, I don't know. I didn't know why I didn't like comprehend it was from the salt. And so at mile 50, I ended up drinking a cup of broth because I thought I might be behind still on my electrolytes. And um, like immediately I just started throwing up and dry heaving. And I, yeah, I couldn't keep anything down for about 60 miles, but I finally got things turned around. And once my stomach settled, I was able just to kind of get into a groove and start moving until I got to the finish line. Awesome. Okay, so everyone who's uh, listening out there, watch out for your electrolytes and don't yeah. try anything new on race day. Don't overdo it with your electrolytes. <laughs> so that's our advice to everyone. Yeah. <laughs> um, so after Cocodona, 250 mile race, um, what was your rest and recovery like physically and mentally before you started your next training block for Badwater? So Cocodona, um, I recovered extremely fast. I don't know if that's because I was just moving so slow for the first hundred miles. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I, so a big reason I do the low carb thing is I've noticed that it speeds my recovery up. Um, but after races, like I usually give myself a day or two to like not go crazy, but have some sweet potato fries, just like a couple of things that I miss um, before I was low carb. Um, and I, but, but this time around, I didn't do that for whatever reason. Um, I just kind of went right back into the low carb thing. And um, I'm sure that has a big part into how fast I recovered. But I finished Cocodona. It was Thursday morning around 3 a.m. And then I just started running and training again the following Monday. And so I took, it was three days completely off. And then by Monday, I was out running again. And not only running again, but like I was setting a bunch of PRs on Strava for segments that I've done and like pretty consistently with my training. And so recovery wise, it was just like night and day, like I felt super stiff and sore when I finished Cocodona. And then three days later, things felt pretty normal and got back after it. Wow. That's, that's crazy. Incredible. Um, so most people out there uh, know what bad water is. 
Uh, but for maybe the few out there who don't know what Badwater is, maybe just give a quick little summary of uh, that race and what makes it so unique. Yeah, so it goes um, through Death Valley, California, which um, if I remember right, the the history there it has like the hottest recorded temperature on Earth. I want to say Earth. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it has the hottest recorded temperature on Earth, which was in the high 130s. Um, and then, so this race is in Death Valley, hottest place on earth. And then it's also in the hottest time of the year. It's in early July next week <laughs> to be exact. And it's 135 miles all on pavement. Um, temperatures hit the one thirties. Usually they like cool off to the low one hundreds at night <laughs> from what I've read. Um, people have to run on the white lines because apparently the asphalt starts melting their soles off of their shoes. I'm sure it melts their souls off of their bodies too. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's just a really hot ultra marathon that goes from Badwater Basin, which is a certain amount of feet below sea level. Can't remember the exact number. And then it goes all the way to the Mount Whitney portal. Um, so I, I think a lot of people misunderstand like the elevation gain in that race. Like I think a lot of people think it's flatter, but I mean, over the course of 135 miles, you're still gaining about 14,000 feet of climbing. So it's still pretty hilly as you climb to that portal at the end. And me, just from experience being out there as a pacer, you really don't know what it feels like to run in 130 degrees until you're actually out there. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm scared about. <laughs> <laughs> Heads up. <laughs> Yeah. And you're right. The elevation, I was shocked at how many like little hills there were. And then, you know, that climb up to the, the Whitney portal, I don't know how many elevation that is, but it's a climb. And that's in yeah. the last, what is it? 15 miles or something. Yeah. I heard like in a short segment, there's like 5,000 feet of climbing, um, which is pretty good for a road run for like, yeah. And it's at the end. <laughs> yeah. It's at the very end. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, like, just from what I read, the whole, the, the whole race is hard. Like, you know, the first part is extremely hot and I don't know how much it cools off at the, as you climb to the Mount Whitney portal. But I mean, at that point you have so much climbing to do and you're probably just so exhausted from the heat. So I'm sure it's just a fun experience throughout the whole thing. It's fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what made you decide to do the bad water and uh, maybe explain to people how hard it is to get into this race. You can't just sign up and be like, oh, I'm doing it. Well, um, this might not be a good answer, according to everything <laughs> you just said. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so um, I can't remember who I was talking to. Um, it might have been Hector. Um, but somebody was saying, like, hey, if you ever want to do bad water, like, you need to just start signing up right now uh, just to get your name out there. because." Um, you know, your history doesn't matter. Like the race director wants you to come volunteer at the race, to pace at the race, to do his other races. Um, so just kind of start signing up and getting your name out there. And then once you start crewing and pacing and volunteering and really want to do it, he's already seen your name and you'll get selected. And so in 20, yeah, 2019 or 2020, I applied um, and I got picked. <laughs> I, I had, I had no intention of getting picked. I just like, I'll just start putting my name out there. Like I suck in the heat. I have no interest in doing this for another few years. Um, so I got picked in 2020 and I was like, crap, <laughs> I, Oops. this is, I guess this is a big opportunity because this apparently doesn't happen that often. So I better train for it and accept the invite. Um, but that year the race canceled, it was like a week or two before the actual race happened just because COVID started to pick back up in Inyo County. Um, so he gave all of us the option to either do it in 2021 or 2022. And I chose 2022 just because I wasn't sure what 2021 was going to look like with COVID and I didn't want it to cancel again. So yeah, here we are. Um, it wasn't that hard to get in, but wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you do, there are like qualification, like you have to do a certain amount of hundreds and like it's from a list of hundreds. So, you know, it's like no different than Western states. There's qualifying races that you have to do. Um, but yeah, so in my well, case, congratulations on getting in. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
So um, what's training kind of been like the last few months for this race specifically compared to other hundred milers? Um, I'm doing a like, like 90% road running because it's a road race and that's different mm-hmm. for me. Um, you know, my house is 30 feet from a trailhead that connects to dozens of other trails. So like I, I literally run 20 feet to 50 feet on the road every day. Um, usually <laughs> because I just do trail races. So I've been doing a lot of road running. Um, and then the other thing too, uh, I try running at the heat of the day, which um, is not too hot where I'm at. It's finally starting to get hot here, like low 90s, but um, we've been in like the low 70s leading up to this week. So for me, like I've been doing some layered running in the afternoons, like throwing on a hoodie and a puffy. Um, and then I also got a gym membership and I've been going to the sauna every single day and usually do it right after my run when my heart rate's a little bit up. And then just to get used to exerting yourself in the heat, like when I'm in the sauna, I do push-ups, I do jumping jacks, I do calf raises, like these, like just little body weight mobility exercises that I can do in the sauna just to get used to that. So I'd say those are the big things, road running, running in the afternoon in the heat of the day, and even throwing on some layers if it's not hot Mm -hmm. enough, and then hitting the sauna for 30 minutes every day after my work my runs. And how hot does that sauna get? Mine doesn't have a temperature, but they say it's 150 to 160. (laughs) And I've been taking in like a bottle of water and pouring on. It's a dry sauna. Mm -hmm. And so adding water makes it a little bit hot. So I think like 160s for sure. Um, High 160s when I pour water into it. I can't imagine actually doing like jumping jacks in there. (laughs) Well, hopefully it translates to running in 130 degrees. Yes, exactly. Um, So again, making this race so unique, what are some of the logistics involved, such as your crew, your pacers, your vehicle? Because you do kind of stop every one mile for your runner. Yeah, so I um, this race is really stressing me out because there's a lot of rules. (laughs) And I don't, um, one thing about me that I've learned is the less I know, the better I do. And so like, I'll show up to a race, not knowing a thing about it and just kind of like adapt on the fly. And that works the best for me, but (laughs) this race, I can't do that because there's like, there's dozens of rules that you have to follow. So I've, I've had to prepare a little bit more for this race, which I don't like. (laughs) Um, but yeah, so there's tons of rules, like, you know, vehicle wise, like they recommend no smaller than a minivan, but they also have size requirements. You can't be bigger than like you can't do a sprinter van or something like that. Right. Um, so figuring out the right vehicle to get, um, making sure that you're renting one that has working AC, like requesting a van that's white and not black. (laughs) Um, so just like little details like that, um, your crew follows you, they essentially follow you basically at a minimum, they recommend every two miles. So, you know, see your runner drive two miles, park on the side of the road, I catch up to my crew, they switch my bottles out, spray me off, whatever. Um, You know, there's tons of pictures of pacers running next to their runner and just like spraying them down with a garden hose or like a hairspray bottle or something like that. So just making sure, like, I'm sure it's more exhausting for the crew. You might be able to attest to that since you've crewed and paced out there. I tapped out when we got to um, a Lone Pine. I'm like, I don't think I can do that more (laughs) that's 70 ish (laughs) miles right yeah but it's just it was a lot of work yeah Yeah. Yeah, and then the stopping like you can't really take a nap or anything you're constantly moving that's like the good thing about crewing is you can like drive to the next aid station and hang out for four hours before you see a runner but like this is super interactive so i can't imagine how hard it is to crew and pace here yep um but so yeah your crew is always following you you need to I have plenty of fluids with you and like ice is not terribly available in this area. So you got to pack enough ice for the trip. Um, Advice I've been given is like, you know, because there's a hundred or so runners, which means there's a hundred or so vehicles out there. And so like, you know, I've been told that I should like figure out a way to make myself uniquely pop out at night. So my crew can see me Um, And then figuring out a way to make our vehicle uniquely pop out so I can spot them easily for the night section. So 
logistically there's just a lot um that you got to plan to be able to cool yourself off and make sure that you're okay and and move as fast as you can to get to the finish <laughs> you gotta have a strong crew and you have a crew and a crew chief yep um i got four people so they rec so you have to have two at a minimum and four at the max mm -hmm. um, so i have four people coming two people i coach hector will be there um ben light we do a lot together he's he's yep. the crew chief. will be out there <laughs> usually my, my wife would be there but she has a bike race um her first century this weekend so she's not coming so i'll miss having her there but <clears throat> I have a good crew to take care of me. Yeah. And Hector's been there. So he kind of knows how, how it all works out. Yeah. All the advice, like the get stuff to make myself pop out at night. Like that was all from Hector. Mm -hmm. So he's been nice. helping me a lot get ready. <laughs> nice. So what are your goals going into this race? I mean, obviously just to finish, <laughs> like I'm going to finish <laughs> this race, but um, I'd like to do it in under 24 hours. 24 um, hours. Like I, you know, it's always fun trying to be realistic while setting your goals. Um, mm -hmm. and just realistically, like the course record, like, obviously I'd love to get it, but, um, I don't think I'll re realistically get it. <laughs> so uh, I do feel like I could get sub 24 though. So that's the main goal. Nice. Love yeah. it. Love it. Um, so with the extensive heat and running on the hot asphalt, you know, there's always the rumors how your shoes melt and to stay on the white line and all that. Um, how many pairs of shoes and socks are you bringing? Um, uh, I'll bring a lot of socks. <laughs> My plan right now, because I've heard, I've heard like between all the water getting poured on you and how much you yep. sweat, like your feet just start collecting tons of water. So I'm planning on changing my socks like every 15 to 20 miles. Um, <clears throat> there's a brand of cooler that I use called Canyon Coolers. And they're like a competitor of Yeti. But they have mm -hmm. this huge like cooler that's the, the as long as a desk basically um, that I that I have coming that I'm gonna use. I'm gonna just gonna fill that full of ice, and every 15 miles I'm gonna sit in it um, while I change my socks. And so I'm probably gonna ice bring, coffin. Yeah, like Scott Jerk did. Um, it's not quite <laughs> big enough for me to lay down, but I'll be able to submerge my legs in it at least. <laughs> um, so yeah, changing my socks every 15 miles or so. So I'll probably bring about 10 pairs of socks. Um, shoe wise, I'm probably just going to bring three. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully that's enough. <laughs> um, I'm trying, you might have input on this. But like, do you think bringing a pair of trail shoes would help for something like this? Like adding a little bit of elevation to your, like to the platform of the, the shoe? You know, my shoes didn't melt. Um, they were totally fine. I only did 30 miles, but they were totally fine for me. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't remember what my runner did, how many times he changed his shoes. Well, maybe I'll, maybe three is enough. We'll yeah. See. I think three is probably enough. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So, uh, you know, still on the, on the topic of feet, you know, you see all these pictures of people get some nasty feet out there. So what are some other things you're going to do to prevent all that of taking care of your feet? Um, I think just changing the socks every 15 miles to 20 is going to help a lot. Um, I feel like a lot of people who have feet issues aren't changing their socks out that much. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't want to throw Hector under the bus, but <laughs> I remember <laughs> it was Moab 240 last year after I finished, yep. I went out to see him at the aid station that he was at. And like, we took his shoes off and his socks were awful. Um, just like crusty and dusty, fill of sand or sorry, full of sand. And so like, when we took the shoes off, I was like, dude, how old are these socks? And he's like, oh, I've worn them the whole race. You change your socks. <laughs> and so um, I was like, yeah, I change my socks every 30 to 50 miles. Like, so I, I think a lot of people don't change their socks. So I think that's going to help out a lot. Um, and not just changing them out, but getting a towel and wiping my feet down and drying them off and reapplying mm -hmm. some squirrels nut butter. So just making sure I'm constantly taking them off, airing them out, making them clean, and then putting on clean socks. Um, aside from that, I don't know what else to do. That's what I've done at my races and I and rarely get blisters. Yeah. So yeah. And uh, I think Hector needs to get some Ingenji socks too, right? I know they were, what were they? Dry max? <laughs> I don't <laughs> I know. They were <laughs> Anything special you're going to do for hydration and uh, electrolytes, nutrition for a hot, hot race like this? 
Yeah, I'm still I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, that's the one thing I think the low carb approach is gonna um, really help me with, just mm-hmm. because when you do this approach, you can um, get by without eating as often. And I would assume that running in that kind of heat, like everything your body's doing, trying to cool yourself down, the less you eat, the happier your stomach's gonna be. So I'm gonna try to lean into that and not eat as often. Um, and then electrolyte wise, just, um, you know, taking an electrolyte capsule every 30 minutes um, and making sure I'm drinking adequate water with that. But I don't not know. 4,000. Not 4,000. No, <laughs> that's a little <laughs> too much. <laughs> so, yeah, just, um, you know, I bought a few insulated bottles that I'll have and then just changing that out. Like, I'm going to try to drink two bottles every two miles. I don't know if that's mm-hmm. too much. I'll, I'll adapt if I start to feel that that's too much, but, but yeah, um, I don't have an answer to that. I'm just going to wing it. <laughs> oh, great. So for those, uh, following, uh, do they provide a live link? How do we follow and keep up on the race? Yeah. Um, I might have to email that to you, but okay. so historically they have it because there's like nothing out there. There's no service, Right. But they've said that they've been able to establish an account with Starlink this year. Okay. Mm-hmm. So there is going to be some kind of broadcast. I don't know how intense it's going to be. I'm sure it's not going to be like Cocodona, but. <laughs> um, <It> spoiled us. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, there's, uh, he actually emailed us last night, the link for tracking and stuff. So I'll just have to send that to you. Perfect. All right. Well, we'll, we'll let the audience know. Um, And that pretty much wraps it up for Bodwater. Thanks for taking the time to speak with us today. And we wish you the best of luck out there and uh, hope you don't melt. (laughs) Me too. (laughs) That would be nice. We know your feet will be taken care of. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. And for those that are not following Mike, uh, his Instagram handle is the low carb runner and he's constantly posting great stuff and send him a message and he'll actually respond back to you too. So it might thanks, Mike. I will. (laughs) 